choir will sing our hymn of preparation, Walk in the Light. And then you'll hear a few words from me about the power of praise. joyous that is 
Thank you so very much, choir. God, I thank you for the preaching moment. I pray for your spirit, your anointing to preach and to share. I pray, oh God, that you be glorified, oh God. And most of all, oh God, I pray that hearts are open to receive, to hear something that will guide and something that you can build upon and hold on to in this week. For none of us know what we may encounter when we leave this building. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And so we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk for a few minutes and walk you through the power of praise. The power of praise. During this special time of year, we celebrate Advent by reading the words of Luke as he tells the Christmas story. The birth of Christ marks a time when hope is revived and love is shared with everyone. In the Gospel of Luke, we find Mary's song. She is praising the God who has chosen her to be the mother of God's only son, the Christ. Her words are powerful and hold lessons that we can learn today. Of the four Gospels, Luke is the only one to speak of Mary's song. I've shared before that for women who often struggle with finding themselves and their voices in scripture, Luke is the gospel that really shares more of a feminine perspective. It is in this gospel where we hear stories of women and stories of the women who were disciples. Yes, we see the 12, but there were many women who were disciples who followed him and gave to his ministry and tended to him. In this story, Mary is visiting with her cousin Elizabeth, who is the mother of John the Baptist, and we talked about that last week. And upon that visit, Elizabeth is asked in verse 43, how could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary is aware that she is going to give birth to the Christ child. Remember the angel Gabriel has spoken to her and shared God's plan. But it seems that when she hears Elizabeth's question, she is overtaken with a spirit of praise. Mary's song, you see, is a song of praise. It's a testament and a testimony to the power of praise. She is not just sharing her thoughts with her cousin. She is saying that God is great and her spirit is rejoicing with the news that has come to her. Today, friends, Mary's song is called the Magnificat, meaning my soul magnifies the Lord in Latin. In the old King James Version, it starts with my soul has magnified the Lord. It can be heard in Catholic services as well as Lutheran and Anglican churches. Her song has been copied into the Book of Common Prayer and for most Protestant churches like ours is sung during the Advent season. One might wonder why Mary's song would be considered significant. Are they not just words spoken in a moment of happiness? The truth is that her song speaks of who she is and how deep her faith is. In verses 46 to 47, she says, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. 
You see, Mary's faith is rooted in Jewish tradition. She comes from a devout Jewish family, and she believes in the God of her ancestors. There's a time for transi tran I can't even say it. There's a time for tradition, and there's a time when we teach our children. They have to develop their own faith, but they watch us and they follow suit with the tradition of their family and the traditions of their ancestors. In verses 48 to 50, she speaks of God looking on a humble servant with favor. She acknowledges that God is taking her humble status and using it to exalt her for generations to come. In verse 49, she says that she will be called blessed, and we call her blessed today. She says, they will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is holy. She praises God for the mercy God bestows on all who fear him. And when we say fear, we mean reverence for all those who reverence God. In the last four verses of her song, she speaks of the wondrous things God has done for her ancestors, for her, and for all who will just believe. Her recognition of the mighty deeds God has performed and the mercies God has given to the people of Israel is significant. She is telling us that while she may be nervous about her situation, remember she's a young girl who's just been told by Gabriel that she will bear a child who will be the son of God. While she may be nervous about her situation, she knows inherently that God has it all under control. Can we say that this morning? That we know God has it all under control? When things aren't working well, when we're confused, when we're surprised, when change has come, can we have the faith of this little girl who knew that God had it all under control and that God would not give her this blessing only to abandon her? God is a finisher. Whatever God starts, God finishes. And that is for the call that God even has on our lives. God will finish what God has set out to do. So while this song may not be as popular as other passages of scripture, it does bear our time and our consideration. Friends, this is a revolutionary example of praise given by a young girl who is carrying the one and only son of God. She no doubt was feeling some anxiety as she lived in a community that would ostracize her. She was betrothed, but not officially married. She was a virgin. Yet she could not prove that to the community. She couldn't prove that to her family, her friends, or even her foes. She couldn't prove that this was something that was done by God. Revolutionary. There are three types of revolutionary thought that begin in the words of Mary's song. Let's look at a few of those. Her words in verse 51, she says, he has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud. Her comments convey a moral revolutionary thought. She is speaking of the death of pride. In our world today, we hold to a lot of pride. We tend to turn a blind eye to those in need, and we refuse to ask for help when we need it. Not only do we not help others, sometimes we have a need, and we're too prideful to ask for what we need 
And there are those who are available in places where we can go to get help, but we won't do it. Our pride, friends, can hold us back from acting on God's direction and being obedient to God's call. Secondly, we can look at her song in a social revolutionary frame of mind. You see, Mary says, he has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Mary knows that she is nothing special to the eyes of the world. She is a poor young girl who is to be married. Yet she sees her situation as God exalting the lowly. God does things in the opposite of what we would do. Scripture tells us that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. God has seen fit to use a poor girl to bring the greatest gift to the world. We can learn a few things from this. Our society puts a lot of importance on prestige and wealth. Supposedly, the more we have, the better we are. God is proving that the world's labels and prestige are not that important to him. God is looking at the heart of a person, a heart of a person. In the Old Testament, in Samuel, when they were looking for a king to reign, God said, man, people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God is looking at the heart of a person as God did with Mary. So we've talked about a moral revolutionary thought, a social revolutionary framework, and an economic revolution. We see an economic revolution when she says, God has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God's words teaches us that our status at the bank will not matter when God comes again. When God calls for us on that day, whenever that day may come, it doesn't matter how much is in the bank or if you have nothing in the bank. To live in obedience to God, we should not gain wealth and let our fellow citizens go hungry. Having wealth, friends, is not a bad thing. We need to have money to live. And those that are fortunate enough to have excess and to be able to do more is a blessed thing. The issue is not worshiping it. When the Bible says the root of all evil, it's not money. The root of all evil is the worshiping of money because our God is a jealous God and anything that we put before God is not pure. The issue is how we choose to use our wealth to glorify God. Mary's song has a strong moral, social, and economic thread throughout. It is woven with her powerful words as she praises God for the blessing God has bestowed upon her. If you remember this morning, we're talking about the power of praise. Mary is teaching us about our personal walk with Christ. Scripture teaches us about God and tells stories about the feats that God has done and what God's people have done. But more importantly, it teaches us how to live today with Christ. The first thing that shines is how Mary had been what one pastor calls saturated with Scripture. She was full of the word. Her words allude to passages found in Psalms and many other books of the Bible. She also alludes to Hannah's song found in 1 Samuel. Hannah was also childless, and she is the one who prayed for a son, and her son Samuel became one of the greatest judges in the Old Testament. She's talking about Samuel, just as Mary is. 
Hannah was singing a song of praise for the child God was giving her. Mary knew the scriptures, friends. She had, she had them hidden in her heart and mind. It's important to know some scripture. I'm not legalistic. You may not be the type that will read the Bible every day, but find a story. Find a scripture that you can meditate on. It blessed my heart in visiting Nancy Bixby in the hospital, and I did my pastoral thing, and I read my scripture, and she said, but there's a scripture that I was taught when I was a little girl. You remember, Erica? I was taught this scripture. Can you read it? And it was Psalm, I believe, 121. And as I started to read it, she recited it word for word because it was in her, it was taught to her. If you have one passage that you know, I encourage you today to get it down in your very soul. Mary had hidden the words in her heart and mind and we're taught that we are to hide God's word in our heart that we not sin against God. Mary can help us because she also displayed a heart of humility. In verse 47, Mary says, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. She recognizes that God is her savior, meaning she recognizes that she is a sinner. And we don't like to use that word anymore, but it merely means where we've missed the mark. Mary recognizes who she is and where she comes from, and that anyone else could have been a better choice but she was humbled by the fact that God chose her. The words of verses 46 to 49 display an attitude of thankfulness. Mary could have focused on the situation and felt nothing but fear. Instead, she focuses on the blessing within the turmoil. That's a word for someone. There's always a blessing in the turmoil. In the wrestling, there is light. In the difficulties, there is hope. God is always moving, and the thing that we resent, the thing that is happening, is God making us into something, and God closing a door or making something difficult because God has something awesome over on this side. But we're sometimes so busy looking out that window that we missed the whole side of what God is doing on another side. She focuses on the blessing within the turmoil. People would ostracize her for having a child out of wedlock. They may find her story again hard to believe, and this happens to us today. We put our focus on the negatives of every situation we face when we should be giving thanks to God for allowing those situations to happen. As I said last week, her praise allowed her to do it afraid. We see Mary trusting the Lord. In verses 54 to 55, she speaks of the Abrahamic covenant. To believe in this covenant means she has faith. She trusts that God will keep God's promises, even in the hard times, and that we too must keep the faith and trust in our God. Friends, the Magnificent is a revolutionary song of salvation whose political, economic, and social dimensions cannot be blunted. People in need in every society hear a blessing in this song. The battered woman, the single parent without resources, those without food on the table or without even a table the homeless family, the young abandoned to their own devices, the old who are discarded, all are encompassed in the hope that Mary proclaims, says Sister Elizabeth Johnson. Friends, this was so revolutionary that the Magnificent was banned from being sung or read in India under British rule. In the 1980s, it was banned in Guatemala. 
In addition, after the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, whose children disappeared during the dirty war from 1976 to 83, placed the Magnificat's words on posters throughout the Capitol Plaza, and the military junta of Argentina outlawed any public display of Mary's song. It is inspirational. It is revolutionary. It is powerful. Praise, friends, is what we do. Praise is our call. Praise should be our lifestyle. Praise is our foundation and praise is our shield. Praise, my friends, is a weapon. It's a weapon when life comes at us in situations and people come at you. When they betray you, they lie on you, they seek to demolish you. If we can get to a place of praise, to say you can do what you want, you can say what you want, but I choose to look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Praise is warfare. Praise brings victory and praise moves the heart of God. If you feel like your prayers are only hitting the ceiling, if you feel like you're not connecting, try praising God. Try lifting your hands and say, God, I can't do it. God, who am I, as Mary said? But I lift my hands to the one to whom I pray, I lift my hands in praise. I, I have gratitude for what you've already done. If you never do another thing, I choose to praise you. I choose to acknowledge that you are God. And I'm grateful and I'm thankful for you. Watch how it changes you. The situation might not change right away, but friends, there is power in praise Praise is revolutionary. There is power. There is power. There's power in praise. Choose praise today. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's okay to say hallelujah. It's okay to exclaim the goodness of God.